Good evening from London. My name is Vikas. Um, as the title at the bottom of the screen suggests, we're going to be speaking about something called esports. Uh, yes, you've read that right. We're not talking about sports, but esports. Everything has to have an E in front of it nowadays uh, to succeed, it seems. So um, I'm privileged that, you know, through my work, I have met quite significant people. And actually, during World Education Week last year, uh, I met with our next guest, who, who, is a, who is a teacher in a school in the UK. Um, and he talked about how through esports, he was able to engage kids in his school or his college rather, um, rather more successfully. And so, and so today I, I'm pleased to welcome uh, James uh, Fraser Murison to, to this, uh, to, our, to, our, to our session. Uh, please say uh, hello, James. Hello everyone. Thank you for having me, Vikas. So tell me, James, uh, you're, a, you're a teacher. Tell us about your, your, your school so that people understand the context. Sure. Um, so I'm at a sixth form college in Basingstoke, Hampshire, which sees roughly 2,000 students aged between 16 and 18 uh, embark traditionally on a two-year course that's either A-levels or BTEC vocational subjects. And so we're here to discuss this subject of esports. Um, you know, can you just for for the novice who doesn't really engage with the subject, very much like me actually, uh, but unlike you, I'm not a teacher. Um, tell us a little bit about what are esports. Okay, so roughly speaking, it's human versus human competitive uh, online gaming competitions, for want of a better word. But isn't this something that happens at homes? I mean, so why is a school involved with this? It does happen at home. It, it certainly predominantly happens at home in the same way that painting, reading a book, watching a film happens at home. And I'm sure we wouldn't dismiss people reading a book uh, or painting. Um, so it's a similar approach where this is a huge interest for some, certainly a hobby for many. Uh, it's also an industry that give or take is worth 160 billion pounds. Um, but wow. what yeah, so, but um, what we've been able to do as part of my uh, contribution to the first ever esports BTEC, uh, which I helped write one or two units for, is to create an educational framework that specifically deals with this huge industry, uh, but also deals with the, the kind of elements from that, which could be a more traditional route of business or media or sport or specifically esports within that as well. I mean, when I, when I, James, when I, uh, I, I'm a bit of a Luddite, but I'm not that bad in, in that um, when I think about competitive gaming, mm -hmm. I, I, I think about shoot me up kind of games, right? Like, uh, sure. and, and the one that I'm not saying this is one of them, but say the most famous one being Fortnite in my head, that's lodged in my head, yep. um, where, you know, especially young boys get up very early in the morning and do what they have to on Fortnite and then go to school. Uh, and then come home and then produce a more Fortnite. Uh, and so <laughs> the dangers of uh, the dangers of these kinds of media uh, in terms of uh, framing of shoot me ups and violence, how does that work uh, in an educational context? So it is it is feasible and certainly how we deliver the BTEC course um, at Queen Mary's College in Basingstoke is we currently do the single A level equivalent. So that's roughly five hours a week where it is absolutely possible to do four hours, even five hours in some weeks where there's no gaming whatsoever. In the same way that if you were to do A-level film studies, you don't watch a film for a week. That said, there will be times where you will have to game or review a film or analyze it or critique it or what have you. And that's the difference with bringing in the BTEC. So from week to week, depending on what unit you're studying and you're, you're learning for, it could be looking at the industry, branding, uh, mental or physical well-being. Um, it could be to do with the legalities of, of esports, shout casting and editing units and what have you. So in the same way that everything can be done in, in moderation, I guess, is what we're, what we're trying to say is we are asking you to making a, a judgment or have an opinion on a, on a game particularly and see the benefits of that. Um, but 
more intrinsically than that is to look at all of the soft skills that, that come within this as well. The positive dividends that coming that come with being part of a team, communication, um, problem solving, um, as I say, preparing for your own business eventually, if that's something you want to do. Yeah, so it James, just goes. James, can I ask you a question more on the industry side of things? Right. So you sure. said, I think you said it's like 160 odd billion pounds worth of uh, a sector. Uh, yep. which is which is pretty significant um and, and so tell us in terms of how does it work so i believe that you know stadia in china and mm -hmm. korea get filled up with yep. uh, with esports audience uh, watching two games do competitive gaming uh, while sitting in their chairs and playing right and so tell us tell us a little bit about what are the popular um you know titles who are the popular teams uh, what do young people aspire to nowadays in the esports world Okay, I mean, well, probably something that that many people won't know either is that uh, for a long time the 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 most watched sporting event was always the Super Bowl. Um, you'll find now in the last couple of years that um, esports games such as, as as Dota or League of Legends they now bring in uh, a more a global audience that is more more viewers than the Super Bowl. And although they don't necessarily get that recognition as viewership, they're there and they exist. And what what you'll find is is that you can there are several elements to being involved in in esports, but you can just be an observer or a viewer, similar to if you and I were to watch a football match at the weekend or on Sky or whatever these days, um, or you're a competitor. And all that's doing is making it a little bit more available to the the fans out there, the fans who are interested in um specific brands and you can take uh brands such as uh esports teams sorry such as g2 uh in the uk that there, there's guild and excel and barrage and what have you where if you've got an interest in a game then by the very nature of being a fan you'll start to kind of relate to the best players and so you create that affinity from a young age and you just carry that on. I, I live in Surrey, so I'm naturally a Manchester United fan and have been for a very young age. So I've watched the club over the several decades now, and I have an affinity with players. It's the same within the esports industry. And every every month or so now, you'll see another brand want to get on board with esports teams, uh, such as, as I say, G2 or 100 Thieves. That in itself brings in more awareness. The sponsorship and all of these events is huge and you know hoodies for, for certain teams sell out in minutes and they're a hundred dollars a piece you've got to be wary of the right people in the same way you've got to be wary of of people with magic beans and smoke and mirrors that you know what, what you're following and and the people who don't just want to make say a, a quick buck off your talent if you're if you're a student but again, that's the same with all things there. And, and what we've done with the BTEC, I hope, is to create a nice framework around that where we're, we're conscious of that and we're guiding and helping our students as if this were another BTEC or A-level. And so I suppose I, I go on to this question, which is, you know, um, how much of this is about the big gaming companies creating a market in education, right? And so where is the obvious fit? Um, I, I know the question is rather provocative in some ways, uh, but because I know how you're going to answer, I'm comfortable asking it as well, because it, <laughs> because it, it does come up, right? Uh, is this something that the big games companies have just made up and so they can sell their products even further? It could certainly, certainly could be seen by that. Um, and, and there's several strands to that, that question. If you're, if you're, I don't know, a, a scout, and you're looking for the, the best esports player for your team. Let, let's kind of water this down on a sort of basic level. Then you're looking for the best players who've got the best sort of reaction time, but graft and hard work and all of those things that would go into a traditional scouting network of a, of a footballer, right? So you're going to get approaches. But also, the further you go up, the more likely are you are going to kind of compete and, and be approached by businesses because ultimately, regardless of what industry you go into, Businesses want to make money. And, you know, forever and ever, businesses have tried to tap up the best talent to make profit. And there's, there isn't a huge difference with that within the esports arena and, and world either. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because as long as the, the people who are approached by the businesses are looked after and esports players are effectively 
professional athletes as well. They've got their own routines, their own diets, physicians, um, mental and physical well-being coaches, all of those things as well. As long as they are looked after in the correct structure, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. That's not to say that the, not everyone's in it for the right reasons. But yeah, some people do want to make money, but some people are are afforded a lot of luxuries and, and money alongside that to compete for those teams. And so, I mean, it goes to this question then. So from a practical basis, you know, you have really turned the tap on with regards to esports at Queen Mary's College. Uh, and so tell us how you came to that and what you actually do so that other teachers who are watching also get the context. Yeah, absolutely. So we're give or take uh, two years maybe into our, our esports journey where we, um, myself, a fellow teacher and the head of IT at the time, we went down to Chichester University, about an hour and a half from us, and they were one of the first universities to offer an esports degree. Uh, the University of Staffordshire in London being another. And the reason why we went there is because we saw what our students are doing when they had a break time. They wouldn't leave the class to go and get a drink from the vending machine. They would go and jump on YouTube or Twitch and effectively watch and spectate other people compete in games, casually or, or competitively, I should say. And so that was an obvious in, as far as I'm concerned. I came back from, from the University of Chichester we put on an enrichment of esports. We used 12 piece gaming PCs that HP had kindly given us. The way that enrichment works at Sixth Form Colleges is if you're free, the teacher is free and you've got an interest, then you can put on film club or debating society. And you tend to get out of 50, 20 turn up. We put on esports. They were prepared to wait an hour after college. We had 65 students turn up. Wow. We knew we were onto something then. I was then approached by the British Esports Association, uh, um, a lovely friend now called Tom Daw, and also Pearson, who create the BTEX uh, on the whole nationally. And uh, I was asked to, to contribute towards the Esports BTEC now. 18, 20 months on, uh, we're predicting 120, 130 students in some form or another to do Esports BTEC or enrichment with us this coming September. We've just received a grant for £250,000 to create the first ever sixth form esports floor, which will have two gaming rooms, classrooms, editing room, and a yoga and a Pilates room. Um, and that's to, as I say, really look after those students from a mental and physical well being as well. So if there's a will, there's a way, is what I'll say to anyone listening. Uh, do, you, do, do some research, do get in touch with me by all means if you want some help with that. But we certainly enjoyed the enrichment to start off with and, and use the students' own expertise to, to get some help and advice, I'd say. But James, in terms of what does it do to learning outcomes if, if for a child? Well, within the units themselves for the beta, I mean, if it's an enrichment, then it's nothing more than an hour a week of social gaming with friends that you, you possibly didn't know beforehand. Yeah. There's no pressure. It's an hour on, an hour up. That's it. You're done. Come back next week. The BTEC that I'm currently running is for the first time ever as a traditional media teacher. I've now got media students, business students, but students who are doing further maths and physics and chemistry. So first of all, there's an ecosystem there where traditional students wouldn't always mix in that type of class. But also what it's doing, again, it's got already high dividends with positive uh, and mental well-being. They're happy kids. They're kids that have got a 98% attendance and a 98% punctuality and submission of work, including a lockdown, because this is such a unique course and it's something they enjoy. It's contemporary, but it's got future proof skills because it's preparing them for this global industry, but focusing on organization, teamwork, communication and problem solving. And if I said list those things down on a separate piece of paper, there isn't a single employer anywhere who wouldn't say those skills are essential and much needed. So they are working towards goals specifically for the BTEC units. Um, so is there an impact on other kind of subject areas through esports? So, for example, uh, if, a, if a student comes in and uh, you know, does your esports BTEC or this, does enrichment, have you seen an improvement in their grades for mathematics or for history or for English? Yes. Uh, did you see that? Yes, and, I, and I, I promise you that. And there's two reasons for that. The, the really easy one is to say, well, if you enjoy this course and you enjoy the time where you get an hour a week to game, and we're, we, also, um, we also compete in what's called the British Esports Association every Wednesday where colleges and schools up and down the country compete with each other. 
and we're, we're starting that again tomorrow now that we're, we're sort of coming out of lockdown so if you want the fun that comes with that and the responsibility and you don't want to let your team down then you go to all of your other classes if you can't do the basics of turn up on time all of the time you don't get the reward and and they know that and that's I've, only once in in a year and a half have i had to have one occasion where a kid owed two pieces of homework for two subjects and he didn't get to compete on a wednesday only once and the other thing is this is such a novel niche new engaging subject and yet still worth 160 billion pounds that they want to be involved because they are at the front of this or at the vanguard of this within education oh. that many colleges have never seen or done before and so um it strikes me um for whatever reason and maybe i'm wrong uh, how do you get gender diversity in esports i mean so i imagine there's a bunch of boys like you know who, who go nuts about this stuff uh, yep. is, 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 is do you see the same with girls dependent depending on what stats and data you read it, it's commonly agreed that give or take 48 percent of gamers uh, are non-male wow. right so let's fine let's call that 50 50 for the sake of this conversation when i started the the btech um i made sure that out of the teaching team uh out of the three of us one of us uh is is a uh, is female and that's natasha so natasha teaches on the BTEC, the two classes along with myself and another gentleman called Matt. So the diversity issue and approaching stereotypes is at the very beginning met with a female um, presence within within the classes. On top of that, uh, a third of each uh, class members in the two classes I teach are non-male anyway. And we would also look to, if possible, look to push up um, a waiting list of, of non-males over males for that very reason. And we've mm. also, from next September, we're putting a scholarship scheme together for students from a non-white background or, or non-male background, uh, sort of like a, a diversity approach to, to make those students have the, the best kind of uh, experience of esports with us. So, James, there's some questions that have come in online. I'm sorry, but I can't see this user's name, but they've sent a comment on Facebook. And they've said, how do you examine gender within esports? Uh, some esports have been criticized for creating hypersexualized female characters and that female players are also experiencing sexual harassment in the online environment. How do you use your class to transform this or bring awareness to this, this issue? So you kind of covered that a little bit. Do you want to say anything more? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of do those, those questions uh, as they come through. So examine agenda. So one of the first things we do you know, is we use the creative arts elements of, of the BTEC to look at stereotypes and um, gender appropriateness. And we look at, if you take something like League of Legends, the, the costumes and the hypertextualized, over the top, over serialized female characters in comparison to the, yeah. the non female characters and why this is wrong. Um, and we do that, we do that within art, media, and film. So we carry that across. We also set the standard by, as I said earlier, having a female um, teacher. Yeah. And we also make sure that whether it's an open or a closed forum, students can comment and contribute as to why they think this is right or wrong and what's appropriate about that. And so we make sure we don't fall into the trap of just teaching uh, teenage boy white kind of material yeah. because that doesn't help anyone. In terms of um, the toxicity online, well, like many schools and colleges, there'll be an online policy they would have signed up for to do with cyberbullying and appropriateness and what have you. So that's the same whether you do esports, business or chemistry. If we are aware of it and it's inappropriate use or language, we will tackle it in the same way as, as we would with other subjects. And also we make sure what is what is right and what is wrong. And we understand and we tell them if we catch any of this happening within our students, you're off. You're out of the team. Yeah. After that, we follow the usual disciplinary procedures. And we also, we go through examples of why this course is preparing you for an industry. You wouldn't do that for paid employment. Why is that acceptable here? So we, we try to cover it as much as possible. So Oksana is asking this question, do you think that esports is suitable for all ages and why? Um, I think it, it will come down to, once again, moderation. So I, I'm not saying that this, I'm not saying that, Call of Duty uh, or CSGO is suitable for a six-year-old at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, absolutely not. 
What I am saying is that there are some dividends and benefits to be seen for a, a six-year-old to play Minecraft, which is a, a sort of pretty stereotypical go-to game. Uh, but there's a reason for that, and there's a suitability of that. So I have a seven-year-old son. Uh, we we play. Uh, we're currently playing Lego Harry Potter. So I play with him, and I've watched him develop his own problem-solving skills. I'm not saying that he's now going to go on and split the atom, but I'm saying I've seen him develop because of gaming. In the same way that we'll also go and play Hungry Hungry Hippos. Okay, fine. It's done within moderation. I never leave him alone. We turn off the Wi-Fi connection, so he's never going to be engaged in an online forum with with strangers either. So as a parent, I've got that responsibility. Okay, and I know that we've got to keep an eye on these things as I get older and he gets older. Discord is another social uh, kind of media channel that I think a lot of parents need to be aware of. And again, it will come down to a certain amount of trust and whatever relationship you have with your son or daughter. The older you get, obviously, you'll have more access to more games, suitable or not. You've just got to approach that conversation with your child in the same way that if you give them access to Netflix and their own account within that, there's got to be a certain amount of trust. And you've got yep. to put those safeguarding issues in place. If it's done within, to answer the question, within an educational setting that we're doing, we don't compete on any games that are 18 certificate or over currently because that's a tricky one to, to sure. maintain and manage. So everything was it's done, obviously, within the legalities of the game as if I were to show a 15 certificate film. So dependent on the game, dependent on the rationale, if you want an educational perspective game, then you'll get something from Harry Potter Lego. You'll get a lot more from Minecraft. If you want escapism and you want to bond with your son or daughter, Minecraft or Harry Potter Lego or a Nintendo Switch. It depends what you want and, and what you can do. But as always, everything will come down to moderation, I'd say. Well, James, thank you so much for your time today. I, I, I try to keep these within the 15, 20, 15 to 20 minute mark and we've exceeded that. Just shows the interest <laughs> in the business. Um, hopefully, we'll get a chance to speak again, uh, you know, later in the year. Um, and I look forward to again seeing your school participate in World Education Week if you so decide. Uh, That'd be a pleasure. And so, uh, thank you so much for your time. And I know that I've learned something, and I'm sure <laughs> the viewers have as well. Thank you so much. Thank Bye -bye. you.